emergency declarations, this meeting of the Farmington School Board is being conducted in accordance with Minnesota Statute 13D.021, meetings by telephone or other electronic means. So now I'm calling this meeting to order. Roll call vote, please, Lori. Member Doyle. Sorry, did you say me? Because I just cut out. I apologize. Yes, yeah. here. <laughs> Member Saucer. Here. Member Christensen. Here. Member Carraro. Here. Member Simmons. Here. Member Coletta. She's absent. Thank you. All right. We roll call has been established. The next item of business is public comment. We don't have any public comment to report tonight. Um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. second. Motion by Simmons, second by Carrero. Uh, roll call vote. Member Christensen. Approved, yes. Member Carraro. Yes. Member Doyle? Yes. Member Simmons? Yes. Chair Saucer? Yes, motion passes, we have an agenda. All right, the next item of business is the good news with our superintendent. Superintendent Burke, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Saucer, members of the board and the community. A few exciting things to share. Uh, we got a packed meeting tonight, so I'll, I'll try to go quick. Uh, the first thing is I would like to recognize Ms. Bree Ostoff, our community ed director. Uh, she was recognized um, as a state as a state community educator of excellence by the Minnesota Community Education Association. So congratulations to her and the, the great work that she's done and uh, with her community ed uh, colleagues and continuing to uh, raise the profile of the programs that we offer um, in the district. Uh, exciting week last week had an opportunity to join a couple of virtual science fairs. Uh, Meadowview and FES both had virtual science fairs. And so just another really cool example throughout our district of not being able to do things exactly the same, but still offering great experiences for kids. So uh, Meadowview um, learners actually created their presentations and used QR codes. And then we were able to scan those QR codes and see the presentations that the kids had made. It, uh, made. And then FES learners, they created videos and then shared those out via um by a, a Google folder. So again, uh, people in the community could see those and, and provide feedback and comments. So really, really cool opportunity, even though it's not the, the typical uh, um, thing that we've seen with our science fairs. Um, FES is also finishing up a virtual, um, their virtual um, book fair this week. So again, another opportunity to do things that we typically do this time of the year, just making them look differently. Um, along that lines, FHS is gonna have, um, a virtual post-secondary um, fair next week. Um, so there's more information on the FHS webpage. So if people are interested in learning more about all the different post-secondary options that are out there um, for our secondary kids, if they go to the FH FHS homepage, they'll be able to sign up for that and take advantage of that really cool opportunity. Um, just a, a heads up that we're, we're heading into standardized testing season, um, even though it's, it's not on the forefront um, Minnesota is still requiring that school districts provide that opportunity. There's a little bit of disconnect between um, the state and the federal government in terms of what those things could look like. But right now we need to continue to move forward with, um, with our plans uh, uh, to provide those opportunities for um, our students. And we just wanna remind people that families always have that option, especially given our current circumstances to opt to not have their learners take that. And if they have questions about that, they can contact their schools to get more information. Um, we also have information on our homepage um, regarding the different assessments that we give and talks about how each is used and, and what kind of information that can give each learner. So if people are looking for that, uh, if they go to our homepage and, and under families and under assessments, they can find that information. Uh, I got some good news on the state budget um, front last week. Um, you know, our early budget um, pieces we were getting from the state had a deficit, then it was a a slow surplus, and then last year they reported a potential $1.6 billion surplus for the biennium. Now, there's still lots of things they're trying to figure out with that. Is there some one-time money in it? Is there some other savings? But overall, that's good news um, for not only the state, but for school districts. 
Uh, quick vaccination update. We are now have provided the opportunity for all of our um, all of our, our um, all of our staff to choose to take that vaccination. So we're through every one of our staff. So by the end of March and early April, anybody that wanted that vaccination should have their second vaccination. And Dakota County really stepped up over the last week. They started last Monday and they gave us um, 50. And then on Tuesday, they said, well, we have 375 and we need to fill them fast. And so we punched, uh, Marianne punched a bunch more out to our staff. And then they followed up the next day with another 137, which allowed us to accelerate and get through that. Um, so we're happy to say that we provide those opportunities in the next little over a month. Everybody should um, have gotten both doses that they wanted. And then finally, I um, just wanna share that I'm gonna have an opportunity to share and testify in the Senate K-12 Policy Committee again. Uh, they're, they're looking at their policy bill, which has some really cool language around seat time, um, the opportunity to provide distance learning again for families and not be an online provider, and also um, innovation zone bill. So I had the opportunity to do that earlier, and I guess I get called back, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Not quite as much time this time, only two minutes, so I'm going to most certainly going to have to write down what I'm going to say, otherwise I will be muted after that comes in. So. Uh, yeah, it is hard. So, uh, Chair Saucer, board members, that's what I have for the update this week. Thank you. Nice job lip reading there. I was worried I had my mute on, <laughs> not on. All right, we have our student school board members today. Who would like to go first? Um, I can start this week. Go ahead, Grace. Um, yeah, so for speech, um, this last weekend we had um, the Shakopee tournament, and um, Shakopee is one of the hardest tournaments. Um, it's a like a big tournament, and there's a ton of schools there, and Farmington actually placed um, 12th out of 27 teams, so that is really good. And we actually had several people um, place in the top six in their categories, which is also super impressive because um, there was some tough competition there this week. So super exciting for the Farmington speech team. Um, Student Council, we are still planning some fun events coming back to school and dealing with um, some, just we're gonna try to do some coordination and some homecoming activities, which is super fun for the seniors and has been super awesome to kind of work on planning. Um, debate is starting to kick up practices for next season and looking at the topic. Um, it's super fun for all these activities because we're starting to get more and more in person. So whether that's in smaller groups or socially distanced, just in person, it's, it's, it's getting, increasingly more fun so that is really um encouraging to see as well as coming back to school um i've heard from a lot of people that they're super excited to be coming back to school fully at the end of the month here at the high school and um overall just starting off the trimester this week has from what i've heard gone good and hopefully the rest of the week and the other cohorts have similar positive things to come back about so yeah we're all super excited to be starting a new try and coming back so, yeah, that's all I have. Um, so for my, uh, oops, sorry. Um, Hi. So for my update, um, going off of Grace's hybrid learning, um, a friend and I were actually discussing how like at the beginning of the distance learning that we could really just get everything done at home and then slowly that kind of dissipated. Um, and the first week that I'm back, so last week, um i honestly probably got more work done in those two days than the whole week just because i was in school um and so that was really great and i'm really excited that eventually we're going to go back into the full in-person learning on the 29th um with best buddies um we had our february event and it was our first in-person event that was like a craft bonding night and that was really fun it was great to see like everyone there it was um and we just connected and just did crafts and it was really great. Um, for FCCLA um, on, I think March 19th, we have our breakfast bonding. So we're gonna show up at the school in person and just eat breakfast and then talk. Um, it's going to be our last event simply because it's just difficult to really, there's just so many like other extracurriculars that involve volunteering and stuff. and. Sometimes like those clubs, especially with COVID, can't get enough like participation or volunteering events and experiences. So that's just gonna be our like 
end all for the school year until next year when hopefully things get better with COVID and we can restart FCCLA again. Um, so yeah, that is my update. Thank you for sharing both. I know Grace, it was great to see you in the Instant Command team committee last week and being able to share your opinion on that. So I know it was much appreciated. So I appreciate the participation and what you guys are able to share with us as well. So thank you. All right, our next item of business is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is made up of routine business items that can be acted upon with one motion. If any board member wishes to discuss an item, they may request that it be pulled from the consent agenda and will be acted upon separately. Does anyone have an item they wish to discuss? All right, seeing none, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as stated. Second. Motion by Cuero, second by Doyle. Roll call vote, please. Uh, board member Doyle? Yes. Member Coletta? Yes. Member Simmons? Yes. Member Christensen? Yes. Member Carraro? Yes. Chair Saucer? Yes. Motion passes. We have an, the consent agenda has been approved. All right. The next item of business is reports and communications. We have a guest here, um, Johnny Villarreal from the Bureau of Mediation Services and also, also Marianne Thomas with our HR department. And they'll be talking about interest based bargaining. Welcome and go ahead. Thank you, Chair Saucer, members of the school board. Um, it's our pleasure to have Johnny Villarreal from the Bureau of Mediation Services tonight and his colleague Tiffany is trying to join the uh, board meeting, but we're having a little trouble technical difficulty there. So I don't know if she'll be able to join or not. So, but anyway, um, the school board did have an interest in learning more about interest-based bargaining. And so we did ask um, one of the mediators from the Bureau to come um, meet with us tonight and share a little bit of information about what interest-based bargaining is. Um, if, if you were to really go into in-depth, this is a day-long training. So we are going to get the uh, shortened version of just a brief overview of what interest-based bargaining is about. Um, we have about 30 minutes of presentation plus time for question and answers. Um, so Johnny, I'm gonna turn it over to you if that's okay. Sounds good, Marianne. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, and Marianne, are you able to share with that PowerPoint or? I got it. Not sure how that will Jason's work. taking care of that today. Great, so let me know when that's up and- Can we see this? Uh, it's loading. Yes, we got Perfect. page one. Everyone can see it, I hope. Yes. All right. Good evening. Uh, as Marianne said, my name is Johnny Villarreal. I am a mediator with the Bureau of Mediation Services. The Bureau is the state agency charged with administering the Public Employment Labor Relations Act, which includes things like mediation, uh, both for grievances and contracts. It includes uh, interest-based collective bargaining, facilitation, and training. We also do labor management facilitation and training. Uh, I'm a hearing officer doing unit clarification certification hearings. Uh, we certify elections. And then uh, a little bit about me. I'm in coming up on my 15th year with the Bureau and also a uh, serving Army National Guard member. Uh, spent 2018 in Afghanistan working casualty operations as commander there. So. Uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, the agenda for today, <clears throat> looking to cover some of the topics that we covered during the full day training that Marianne touched on. I'll cover some definitions that uh, IBCB works with uh, and the steps of IBB, and then um, a recording document that parties have used to record each issue and the resolution to each issue. And then talk about the difference between interest-based collective bargaining and traditional bargaining and uh, some of the differences there. And then uh, we'll be able to take any questions that you might have after that. Uh, with that, next slide, please. <clears throat> so in the full day training, uh, we will cover things like conflict and uh, there are different types of con 
conflict that we cover, data, structural relationship, value and interest, um, communication we really hit hard on, active listening, persuading, perception, uh, interest-based collective bargaining really uh, looks at consensus-driven decision-making. And so we spend a lot of time on uh, how to get to consensus and what that looks like. And then looking at, at the end of the day for that training, we'll do uh, some format description as far as what the steps are and how you get there, some of the specifics dealing with each issue, and then uh, some of the foundation documents uh, and the process that we'll go through after that. A lot of the day is also exercises in each of those areas, so it really hits home the topics that we're trying to cover. So some of the definitions that uh, we cover, issues is uh, the subject of the negotiations or the what is the problem to be solved. We uh, sometimes will identify that issue as a question uh, to be solved. And then the interest is the why or the reason behind that problem for each side. So um, again, consensus driven problem solving type of a format where uh, both the union and the employer all are on the same page in the same room. <clears throat> there generally is no caucusing. So you're going to be in the same place the whole day. Um, we generally will go every other seat to make sure that it's consensus driven that way and it, it stays away from positional type of bargaining. So a position is a proposed solution to an issue, regardless of what the interests are. And an option is a proposed solution that has the issue and satisfies one or more of the interests of both parties. When you come up with an option, it's measured against a standard. And that standard is agreed upon qualities and again, by consensus uh, of an acceptable solution based on objective criteria or norms. Uh, the easiest one that I can um, give you on that is the standard of, is it legal? So you might have an option, for instance, hey, let's do a three-year contract with the teachers. Well, teachers by law are, are held to a two-year contract in the odd numbered years. You can't do a one-year or a three-year with them. Or public sector can't cannot have a, a contract more than three years. So if an option were up there about, hey, let's do a five-year contract, the you would measure that against the standard and it wouldn't meet that legal test. Next slide. Uh, negotiations continued. Negotiation is a process in which two or more parties with common and conflicted uh, conflicting vested interests come together voluntarily, and that's important to um, to relay as far as the union and the employer both voluntarily will um, participate in an interest-based collective bargaining process. If one side or the other wants to withdraw from the process, it's over, and, and so it's very much voluntary on both sides. Uh, and you, to put forth and discuss explicit proposals for the purposes of reaching the agreement, right? So that's the ultimate goal in either negotiations or interspace collective bargaining is to reach an agreement, uh, get a contract, right? Uh, and then consensus, the definition, all members must uh, agree on the option or options and can honestly say, I believe that all members understand my point of view and that I understand theirs. And whether or not I prefer this option I support it because it was reached fairly and openly and it satisfies the interests acceptably using the agreed upon standards. So um, the consensus piece may be, it may not have been my preferred option, but I can live with it. And the entire group will move forward with whatever the decision is. That's what basically consensus means. Next slide. So uh, when we go through the steps of interest-based collective bargaining, um, we start with the preparation phase and the surveys, um, which are basically both sides, the school board would talk about what uh, 
issues you want to talk about and resolve in the contract bargaining. The um, union would do the same and really talk about what are the problems or concerns or issues for the IBCB team, which includes both the employer and the union to discuss. And what are the underlying needs behind that? Um, why does the issue need to be resolved? What happens if the issue is, is resolved or isn't resolved? Uh, those are some of the things that can be discussed in the survey process. And then you reach a, um, enter into a process agreement, which basically talks about who's going to be at the table for each party, how many, what's a quorum, so um, what constitutes a quorum where you can still meet, uh, meeting arrangements, when, where, kind of those logistics pieces, um, cost, yeah, is this on um, paid time, not paid time, all of those uh, types of things are discussed in that process agreement. Uh, what's the recording process? What's your communication going to be as a part of that process, um, both internally and externally? So some those are some of the topics that get discussed in that process agreement. Norms of behavior are basics. A lot of just respectful um, behavior gets put out as far as what behaviors will you will help you function the best, and what behaviors will help you make the team function most constructively, what behaviors um, should you avoid. Um, and you can create that list as a group by brainstorming and prioritizing and then evaluating those uh, norms of behavior. And then the final list of norms ends up being agreed upon by consensus. And then I talked a little bit about the standards piece that uh, they're agreed upon qualities of acceptance solutions based on the criteria and norms that the parties reach together. And then uh, identifying standards, issues, interests, the definitions that I went through, the next step would be uh, developing options based on each issue. And so that's really a brainstorming exercise where you can just throw up, you look at quality, not or quantity, not quality. You're just trying to get as many ideas up on the on the table as you can for resolving the particular issue. And then sometimes the final resolution might be a combination of those once you um, evaluate those options and then select one of those options to resolve the issue. And then the final step is to essentially write that final uh, written agreement on that particular issue. Now this process, from the start of preparation through your final resolution is a longer process than the um, traditional bargaining as far as time commitment. And obviously time is a resource, right? So we always talk about that in the training and, and talk about expectations as far as how long is that, that's going to take. So when you look at the issue recording document that's up on the screen, Really, you'll list out all of the interests of the union. You'll list out all of the interests of management on a particular issue. You'll identify the standards that you want to measure against for the options. And you'll sometimes you'll brainstorm those options and then list high, low on if it's a high probability of passing or a low probability that you can live with. And then um, select whatever that is, and then write out the tentative issue. We generally will say um, you're going to look at about eight hours per issue. So sometimes if you've been coming to the table with, say, 30, 40, or 50 issues that the parties are working on, just do the math on that and how long that will take. So it's important when you go forward and you do your surveys that the parties look at really prioritizing what do you want to bring to the table because it will take longer than traditional bargaining. Next slide. So really talking about the differences between traditional bargaining and interest-based. Um, going from the bottom up on the traditional side, basically the parties come to the table, present their proposal, and it's sort of like a tennis match, right, where you're um, party one proposes something, party two 
uh, evaluates it and counter proposes and it goes back and forth across the net back and forth until either you've reached an agreement and the more powerful party prevails or the proposals dropped interest based the parties together by consensus agree on the norms and uh, process and then mutually agree on what the issues are that you'll work on the parties discuss their interests the parties discuss the standards that you're going to measure those options against you brainstorm options the parties evaluate the options and the inter against the interests and the standards and then reach a mutual agreement by consensus that's for every single issue so as you're going through that recording document that was on the previous screen that's for every single issue so it might be wages general increase might be that particular issue it might be 403b it might be health insurance it might be um time off sub pay whatever it is right so those issues each one of those goes through that process and takes that time to do that with that um i thought i'd leave you uh with a, a recent story that was in uh, out of the Manitoba school district and i thought it was uh, uh a powerful statement from the board chair uh that they were going through some controversial uh, issues with uh, a particular person of the day and that type of thing and they were struggling with um, a response to that and how to deal with it right and he said we're evolving together as a school community and as we do this let's do our best to honor everyone's journey to move forward together to assume positive intent to open our minds to others perspectives to listen and learn from each other the board is committed to this and we hope that each person hearing this will commit to it as well so it seemed like a good message to just uh, go into each issue each problem with an open mind and understanding and uh, assume positive intent so uh, i will take any questions you might have johnny i'll i'll turn it over to melissa I'll do my best. It's so hard to read on Zoom sometimes. So is there, it looks like Steve's got a hand up. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. So uh, Johnny, I guess my question on this specifically is if if we start down, if both parties agree to this and we start down this path, um, because again, the time commitment and filling out the documents and stuff, and all of a sudden one group decides, you know what, we don't wanna go down this path anymore. So you said that at that time then this, we'd have to start over with the other process. Is that correct? Let me let me walk through what I've seen in the last 15 years and the decade before that as an advocate. Um, Interest-based collective bargaining can be a good way, even if it doesn't walk all the way through to a final agreement, what it can do is help the parties understand the issues better. So if it were to devolve into uh, or evolve into a uh, traditional bargaining process, the issues that you've identified are still on the table. You're still bargaining on those particular issues. You just move into a positional process where you present a, a proposal, the other party responds with a counter proposal, et cetera. So um, it is not unusual for that to happen. So you're not starting from scratch when this process, if this process were to end, um, and you go into that positional bargaining with a better understanding of what the other party's interests are and what the standards might be and what possible options might be out there for resolving it. But I see more positive about it, basically what you just said is, is identifying each side's entity on that and really digging into that. I, I like that. My only concern would be, um, and again, this would be my first go around being on the negotiating committee is if they bring a hundred items 
Now it's up to the other side to break them down and identify specifically if that, those are the specific ones they want to go through. The in interest based, the parties by consensus agree on the issues. So both parties would have to agree if if the BMS is helping to facilitate interest based collective bargaining and the parties come with 100 issues, we're going to recommend you do not do IBB. OK. OK, thank you. Hannah, looks like you've got a question. Go ahead. Hi, Johnny. Thanks for the helpful overview. You just mentioned that this is typically a facilitated process, something that we would do as a district with the support of a professional like yourself. Correct. Okay. And in terms of cost to the district, is that something that ends up being a flat fee or is it something that's based on the total number of hours invested at the end of the process? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. The Bureau is a state agency and we do not charge for our services for the public sector and private sector for that matter. So we um, would come out, facilitate, and uh, work with the parties to get through that and uh, would be no charge from the Bureau. If the parties wish to have an advocate paid, that would be on the parties and or um, any um, bargaining time that might be out there that, because we traditionally will do this during the day. So you're you're looking at subs and sub pay and, and that type of thing uh, to get coverage. Um, and then um, again, the process is longer. So those those ads can or costs can add up, but um, there is no charge from the Bureau. OK, that's really helpful. Thanks. And then in terms of the time investment that you mentioned, um, would you say that while the time commitment is more significant in your space collective bargaining that more of that work is done behind the scenes or independently like surveys or um, I guess less time at the table physically together, so to speak, and more, um, you know, more shared work outside of that amongst the teams before they come together? That can depend on the parties and their process agreement. So I've seen some of that time obviously will be on that preparation piece, but that's generally done together by consensus as a full group. If the process agreement allows for subcommittees to do some of that work, which I've seen, then a lot of times that can be done between meetings of the full group and then the subcommittee will come out, report out to the larger group and then will uh, the larger group will have that final decision by consensus. Okay, that's very helpful, thanks a lot. Member Carrero, your hand is raised. Do you still have a comment or did you forget to lower it? It's down now. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. And does anyone else? I have a couple questions, but I don't want to go first if anyone else has anything right now. All right. The first thing I'd like to ask is what percentage of districts within the state are you aware of that do the interest based bargaining versus the traditional style? estimate do you have any idea yeah i can't give you a statistic on that uh there probably have to be some analysis on that the the vast majority of the mediation petitions we get are traditional um and the interest-based um many times are um experienced that they will do it every contract cycle and so we we get a lot of the same folks that want refresher training and will continue going through that. We also have <clears throat> the ability to do co-chair training uh, or facilitation training to help the parties do it subsequently on their own uh, and can work with the parties that way. I also represent Farmington on the 917 board, and we have had interest-based bargaining for a very long time. And this is one reason why I was hoping to bring it up. I had the opportunity of serving on the personnel committee this last year when we negotiated with the prayer professionals. And it is intensive time-wise for the parties. Um, but what I found from it personally was it was it was less hostile than some come negotiations can be. Not saying things have been hostile, but just in terms of at the day one, we knew what the issues were from both sides. 
the day one, we've had our superintendent be the facilitator because we've been doing it for a while. And, and he said, day one, this is what the percent we're looking at. Now let's work about the issues. And we went kind of straightforward and we had the time to work through the issues. And there were some that took time, but the committee that had been working together, it there were times things got tense, but it was also just a very decent sense of community that we're all there together and we're just kind of working on the pieces. And I really like that aspect and I like being able to kind of take time with it. It also allowed those on the committee to be able to weigh their feelings and concerns that they had had themselves so they had heard from other members, which took the time now, but during the negotiation process. But what we have found as a district and what I've heard is that when you take the time with those issues during negotiations, there are less likely to be grievances and continuations of problems later. I don't know if you can kind of can if you've had experience kind of seeing that with your experience as well, but I was very impressed with how the process worked and having seen both sides of the table, so to speak, I was intrigued with the style. Sure. As I stated that uh, many times, even if the parties um, move to traditional bargaining, they have a better understanding of the issues and the interests of both sides when they do that, having gone through this process. And some issues lend themselves better to this process than others. If you are at the table and the parties can't agree on the size of the pie, so to speak, for the economics, that might be tough to start there, right? Um, but if um, there's another issue, so it, perhaps you can look at uh, an issue or two or three that lend themselves better to this as an introduction to this process and work on them that way, there may be a way to gain some momentum and uh, keep con continue to work on the other issues that way as well. So it sounds like you're suggesting like a hybrid model of sorts for issues that need to be addressed. And then that's an interesting idea. If, how, how does the process work? Say that's something the board would like to do, do does the board have to agree and then the union team have to agree? Is that how it moves forward? What what would the steps be if we did want to go in this direction? Before you would come to the bureau, both parties would have to agree. So whatever your process is as a board, whatever the union's process is as a union, that's up to the parties. Before the bureau will get involved, we will need a joint petition for interspace collective bargaining. We will not move forward if only one party is is requesting it. That makes sense. I appreciate that. Are there anyone else have any comments or questions or even if Marianne or Jason would like to add anything as well? No, I think that was a great overview. Thank you, Johnny. Great. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure we'll get back with you if we have any other questions. I appreciate your pre your presentation today. Sounds good. We do have a lot more information on our website. So if you go to um, min.gov slash BMS, you can find a lot more information on this topic. Great. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. All right. So something to digest and think about. Our next item of business is a secondary learning model update with Superintendent Berg and Mr. Bossman. Uh, thank you, Chair Saucer, members of the board. I'm going to switch screens here for a little bit uh, see if we can be two for two here um that pop up for everybody yeah I, all right i can't see so you guys yes. okay yes. Thank you. <laughs> all i see is my screen so all right uh so we want to take an opportunity to provide an update to the board and the community uh, where we are with our transition um, with our secondary learners uh, transitioning back to in-person learning. Um, just want to give a brief update on, on kind of uh, where where things started again. Um, like things have happened uh, over the last couple of months, it, it, it starts with Governor Walls uh, announcing a significant change to the Minnesota Safe Learning Plan, which happened on Monday, uh, February 14th. Um, and out of that, uh, the Minnesota, that updated Safe Learning Plan um, allowed secondary students to return to hybrid or full in-person 
beginning February 22nd, if they were able to implement additional mitigation strategies, which we'll get into a second, with the goal of all secondary learners being in either hybrid or full in-person by March 8th. Now, the good news is uh, prior to this update, uh, our, our secondary learners uh, had already started back in, and um, obviously today's March 8th, and um, our, our secondary learners have been in for uh, three weeks for most of them and two weeks for 11th and 12th graders as we started um, third trimester today. Um, the why, you know, why this change now? Again, um, MDE and MDH started out very conservative um, with their approach. I think when they created the parameters in the safe learning plan, they, they had the best information um, available to them at the time. But as they've um, seen how COVID has either interacted in schools or spread throughout um, communities and what's the real driver behind that. Um, they've slowly loosened some of that guidance and, and uncoupled from some of those early indicators that they used before. Um, and, and they've also had um, learners in buildings since the beginning of the school year. And so that's given them kind of a, a real time um, action uh, study to see, all right, this is what we thought might happen uh, versus what we're actually really seeing. And again, what is the driving behind um, any sort of transmission or positive cases that are coming in the building? And really what they've seen is tran transmission in schools primarily happens between adults and not between learners and adults or between learners. Um, it's really those interactions, kind of those times where adults let their guard down a little bit, uh, maybe in meetings, lunches, um, you know, those types of things that they've seen that spread and not so much in, in, in the learning spaces um, where people are following our mitigation strategies. And that would follow what we've seen in our buildings. You know, obviously uh, throughout the, the time we've had learners in buildings, uh, we still have to continue to follow the quarantine guidelines. We've had positive cases um, in our buildings, but we have not had any transmission from a positive case in our building to somebody that's had to quarantine, quarantine based on being in close contact, which in, again is good news, uh, shows our mitigation strategies um, have been effective up until this point in time um, and kind of backs up what they've been seeing. Another big thing um, that they've shifted is they've really um, allowed districts to move away from using that 14 day case rate as a primary metric. Um, we've always had this 5% threshold that we've used for influenza and other illnesses that we've tracked. Um, there have been times where, where buildings, uh, it hasn't happened in, in Farmington for quite a long time, but there has been times where buildings have, have closed down. Um, there was a district in the West Metro last year that started winter break early because they went over this 5% threshold uh, with influenza type symptoms at that time. So if 5% of your learners or staff um, in a given week report influenza or COVID-19 like symptoms, that's an indicator we need to reconnect with our um, regional support team, those health, um, those public health officials, and maybe look at uh, potentially um, maybe a different plan for a period of time or something like that. So that's going to be one of the big things that we track and look at moving forward. Then other pieces, when we had to shift to distance learning um, in October, in November, a lot of that was operational. So we're still tracking, you know, the number of our staff that are in quarantine, the number of our learners in quarantine. Um, what is that level that we can't handle anymore? Um, and, and look at that from a, a perspective of logistically, what can we and can't we do if we reach a certain number of staff or learners out? Um, our quarantine guidance is not going to change. So even though they updated the safe learning plan and allowed some different things, we are still required to follow the same quarantine guidance. Now we did update that to follow um, some changes MDH made uh, when we returned our elementary learners. So just for a review for everybody, if you're a household clo close contact, that's unchanged, it's 14 days and you cannot test out of that. But if you're a non-household close contact, so it'd be a close contact identified in one of our buildings, uh, one of our activities, that's a, that's a 10 day uh, quarantine with a seven day option. And that seven day option is to take a PCR um, a PCR COVID test on or after day five. And if that is negative, then uh, families have the option to return their students, um, you know, after that seven day, day piece. So 
Um, the other uh, additional pieces, uh, as we shared before, we continue to do our biweekly COVID testing program for all staff. So we've had four testing cycles. Today was our fourth, March 8th. Um, good news is, is uh, we have not seen uh, hardly any positives out of that, which is another kind of um, reaffirmation that the things that we're doing and the precautions that we're taking in our district are helping. And also um, gives us a little indication that what we're seeing from some of the other metrics that the spread in and, in and amongst our community is down locally. Um, we're gonna continue to require staff that are present in buildings to wear not only um, a face covering, but also a face shield. That is one of the biggest mitigation factors when we talk to MDH, when they look at other, um, um, other settings, specifically healthcare, um, that whole idea of a face covering and a shield is, is super effective, again, at, at preventing that, that transmission. And, and we're really concerned about protecting our adults. When we go back and look at um, where a lot of that spread happens, again, it's adult to adult. And so what can we do to provide as many layers of protection, as much mitigation to protect our adults in the building? So we're gonna continue that. Um, our, our, our learners will continue to have to wear face coverings uh, when engaging in indoor physical activities. You know, if we can't keep that six feet, we'll use clear plastic barriers between adults um, and learners for small group and individual stuff. Um, one change is that we, at, at the secondary, uh, we do have to maintain three feet of physical distancing. That is different than in the elementary buildings. In the elementary buildings, because we're able to keep kids cohorted by classroom, there is no requirement of that three feet of physical distancing. But when we return to an in-person learning model at our secondaries, there is a requirement. And that, that requirement is significant. Uh, when we did our planning um, last uh, fall around in-person learning, we didn't do any planning with physical distancing because the guidance we, we received said, basically, you don't have to worry about physical distancing when you're in person. So that's thrown a little bit of a wrench into this. And one of the reasons why we pushed out the return um, into uh, the end of March, we are still investigating, working with staff, working with buildings to ensure that we can create those um, instructional environments and maintain that three feet of physical distancing. Now, if our county numbers go below 10, then we don't have to worry about any physical distancing. Staff continue to make that six feet uh, whenever possible. And if, they, if they, they have to go closer to use those clear pl plastic shields. And then again, staff um, protecting each other from staff, uh, maintaining six feet of physical distancing um, from staff. I'm gonna turn this over to Chris to talk a little bit more about what this is gonna look like um, in at each level and some of the things that we're still working on and, and trying to figure out logistically so when the day comes, we're ready to go because we still have some solutions that we need to find. Yeah, Madam Chair and Board. Uh, so when the guidance came out, we took a look at uh, the planning requirements that came along with it. And as Jason said, um, this is something we've been anticipating since last summer. Um, with the two variables that we didn't know about. And that was the organizing to three feet. And then it was the additional 30 minutes of prep time per day for those staff members that are teaching uh, distance learners and or hybrid. And so those were uh, two requirements that we, we weren't quite aware of until it came out in the executive order in November and then in the guidance in February. So we looked at our calendar when it came out and we started to identify some possible return dates um, that seemed to be more of a natural fit. We currently um, are just coming at the start of trimester three. And so we took a look to see, would it be even possible to organize as quick as um, this week? And I think very, very quickly we learned that we're just gonna simply need more time around a lot of these things. Um, our secondary administrators have been looking at their class rosters to see how they might be able to balance as they merge two cohorts together. At the high school, that was a, a little bit more easily done for two reasons. One is they, at last count, have about 24% of their learners that have chosen full-time distance learning. So naturally, when they merge those cohorts together, they are smaller in terms of total class size. And you normally wouldn't think of that when you think of a high school and, and class size. Um, the other element of that has been, um, I'm just blanked on that one. Um, at the middle schools, many of their courses last all three trimesters, right? And so students have built a relationship with a group of learners in their cohort and with that particular group of 
uh, students that are across that cohort with the teacher as well. And so they've been trying to be mindful to plan as to what that might look like. Um, we've also been taking a look at what does three feet mean when we plan, right? So traditionally, we've built a classroom where if you've got 30 learners, you've got 30 desks, and you might have 30 sets of materials. And while that's been the way that we've organized in the past, it isn't necessarily the way that we need to organize moving forward. So there's been a lot of work taking a look at space, taking a look at necessary um, furniture, how we might flex certain learners in and out of classroom spaces to help have a little bit smaller environments within a class for a period of time. Um, each of the three buildings has been including their staff as part of the planning and preparation. They all have their operational transition leadership teams that they've been engaging in a lot of dialogue um, to think about the what ifs. What does this look like when our learners come back? What do we need to be mindful of? Um, at the high school, one of the most significant ones is lunch. Um, you might think of the high school commons and associated hallway space as a significant amount of real estate. But when you start thinking about needing to feed about 400 learners in one, one lunch period, three feet can become problematic. And so we've been working with that um, senior open campus for quite some time. We've been taking a look at how we might reorganize our ninth, 10th, 11th graders to be spread out a little bit better. We've actually had the cafeteria set up now for over one week to three feet so that we can monitor what this looks like um, and figure out exactly what that balancing um, might need. The other thing that people might ask as we move forward is um, about the, the additional 30 minutes of, of prep time. And what we know is that at the elementary and the middle school, we organized to really two very different models of learning that were supported by people specific to that model. So with the Farmington Academy at the middle school, there is a group of teachers that have been dedicated to that group of learners the entire school year. That's what they've been solely focused on. And so they have also utilized that Flex Friday to support if they are a teacher in the Farmington Academy. At the high school, because they've been teaching two, if not three models of the cohort distance learning and in-person learning, um, we just found it extremely problematic to figure out how we could go uh, to a full five days a week. And that's one of the things that we talked about with our incident command team. Um, the other element of this is that we did explore alternate transportation routes. Could we do a half a day on Friday for the high school? Could we do an early, um, an early out or could we do a late start? And it became um, cost prohibitive in terms of it wasn't something that had been budgeted for. And it also presented some staffing challenges and the fact that we may not necessarily have the appropriate number of drivers that we need based on those mid uh, tier routes. And so with all of those elements, um, our teams are still planning together to work on the nuances. Um, they're gonna continue to think about challenges that come, come about. And with today being the eighth, um, we feel good about the fact that we still have three weeks um, to work through a number of those elements. And, and just to add on to Chris's point, I, unfortunately, um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, right, we had to make some decisions at the beginning of the year, especially to how we organized. Um, and we were able to, in the elementary and in the uh, middle schools, to create those, those individual kind of Tiger Academies, the Farmington Academies for our online learners. We looked at that and talked about that at the high school, but one of the trade-offs of that is it would severely limit the number of electives that students would be able to take. Um, and even limit the number of higher level classes, you know, learners would be able to take. And so by having our distance learners spread out through the entire high school, there's a benefit. They could all stay in their classes. They all get to take the things that they want. But now because of this executive order, when we move back to in-person learning, we're still required um, to provide that extra half hour, which is really 2.5 hours a week for that additional prep. And so, um, we really couldn't get around, you know, that Friday piece without incurring additional costs or changing the system and stuff that we had. So um, it, we know that it's not perfect, but it's best on the circumstances that we have. All right. Are there any questions or comments for our team here? I have one. When you mentioned earlier the good news about the majority of the staff having the opportunity to be vaccinated, and as vaccinations go forward, more and more people having that opportunity, do you think the 
um, standards in terms of masking and shields for those with vaccinations might be lifted at all? I know I'm giving you a crystal ball question. It just kind of came out of my head. Yep, so that's a good question. We actually, Chris and I met um, with our, F we've been meeting with our FEA executive board on a monthly basis just to kind of get feedback. And the shield question has continued to come up and I understand it, it's, nobody likes it, right? It's not a great thing, it makes it hard. Um, and what I told uh, the executive board today is that when we get back from our spring break, um, that should be a point where um, everybody that's wanted, like I shared, wanted the vaccination should have gotten their second one. And I'll take that question to MDH and see what their reply is. If if we get an indication that um, you know the you can replace the shield mitigation with the vaccination mitigation, we'll most certainly make make that. Um, you know, it, again, for us, we're trying to to be probably more conservative on that end of things, just from the information that we've gotten from MDH about the strength of that mitigation strategy and stuff. And so until I, and, and I, I asked them about a week ago, week and a half ago, and, and their reply was, nope, it hasn't changed right now. So I, I think it's a good question to ask when we get to that point and we get everybody probably that two weeks pass their second dose so they can get the full thing. So I don't have a crystal ball, but as we see, right, they are, I mean, they are changing guidance around vaccinations, right? They're saying that, you know, if people are fully vaccinated, they can start to gather in small groups and things. So a month and now things could change and, um, and we will most certainly respond and, and, and do what we can to maybe relieve some of those things that are pinch points from people, even though they're, they're really safe, so. I appreciate that that's something I've been hearing a lot and that does seem like the CDC keeps changing new guidelines and there was something that came out recently today regarding that, so I appreciate that. One other thing I just have to joke around, I see the three feet and I, I imagine everyone's gonna get like a tiger yardstick, you know? <laughs> so here's the thing, I mean, we just, you know, we're gonna organize to three feet in our instructional spaces and just like we talked with our elementary, you know, uh, you know, our elementary people that you're, you're not going to be, it's going to be impossible to be the social distancing police, right? So we're going to create spaces in our, in our spot and, and get kids there and then we'll work with them and, and stuff like that. But it's, we'll do the best we can, but it's going to be, yeah, no, we're not going to get little bubbles and stuff with people to walk around with and, and bump into each other. But I do, I still have my six foot noodle back here. You can kind of see it. There it is in the corner. If anybody I could cut it in half and we could share it. So no. So we're yeah, we'll do the best we can with that and make sure our spaces are to that, that, that three feet. Please, do you have a comment or question? Go ahead. I do. Um, I'm just curious, and I don't know, I guess, if this is decided yet or um if it's already been said and I missed it with all the different considerations, but um I'm curious, um, when we at the high school go back to four days a week, um, both cohorts, what um, like threshold would it take for us to have to shift back to either hybrid or like full distance? Is there a certain number of cases or is it like percentage? And is that different from the cases that were at the beginning of fall? Have it, has it been like high lifted yep, so, or lowered? Yeah. Yep. So what we would track, Grace, we would start by tracking the, the number of students each week that have flu and COVID-like symptoms. And when that percentage gets to 5%, then we would start to have some discussions with our public health people, Dakota County and MDH, to see what their recommendations are. And, um, you know, I, I, we, we haven't made a decision yet, but, you know, it, it, it's probably more likely if we had to shift, we have maybe shift to a distance learning model based on some of the feedback that you and other students gave and, and do that for a shorter period of time and then come back to in-person after we have a little bit of a pause. But that that first metric that we're gonna use will be that, that, that flu and COVID-like symptoms number. And the other one that'll have an impact on that too is the number of, of learners and, and staff that are in quarantine. You know, if we start getting 10%, 15% of our staff in quarantine, you know, again, we can't function that way and we'll have to, to make a decision to a model. And same thing, if we start getting high numbers of learners in quarantine, it's really hard to kind of, to do both of those things. So those will be some of the big things. 
And to your to your more to your question, it that will be and is different than what we did at the beginning of the year, where we sold we we focus solely on our county case numbers. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. All right, I think we're ready to go on to the next step. Is there a motion to acknowledge reports and communications? I can make a motion to acknowledge receipts of reports and communications as presented. Second. Motion by Coletta, second by Christensen. Roll call vote, please. Member Doyle? Yes. Member Coletta? Yes. Member Simmons? Yes. Member Christensen? Yes. Member Carraro? <laughs> Member Carraro? Steve, we can't hear you again. Chair Sasser? Yes. Motion passes. We have an eligible receipt, uh, receipt of reports and communications. All right. Now we're moving to our administrative action portion of the agenda with Mr. Dan Miller. And we've got a variety of items. My suggestion we just go point by point and let you have the floor. All right. Thank you, Chair Sasser, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Berg. Um, yes, I, I do have a number of things. So, um, We'll try to get through it in under two hours. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so uh, before we jump in, uh, because there are a number of items, uh, first just want to kind of do a little bit of an overview um, regarding uh, these four projects, uh, but more specifically um, how they fit in context-wise uh, with funds that we have remaining in our 2015 bond. Um, as well as our long-term facilities bond uh, for the TLLC. And so, um, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about this a number of times, um, but just kind of as a refresher um, and as well for the community, um, uh, 2000, our 2015 bonds, uh, you know, we've accomplished a lot of different projects uh, with, that, uh, with that money. Um, we've been very, very fortunate uh, in terms of so many projects coming in uh, quite frankly, you know, well below budget uh, and the amount of projects that we've been able to accomplish is, has uh, been quite astounding, to be quite honest. Um, and even with that, uh, we still have a significant uh, amount of funds available uh, that we need to uh, tackle, uh, spend down and use for projects here uh, over the next, you know, six-ish or so months. In addition to those funds, um, if you recall, uh, we bonded, uh, long-term facilities bonded uh, for $10 million uh, for uh, the significant mechanical uh, renovations at the TLLC uh, site. Uh, once again, um, that particular project uh, came in uh, pretty significantly under uh, what we had originally budgeted uh, for. Um, and so what that means is that we also have some dollars left in that particular account as well. So when we pool those dollars uh, together um, and, and look at what we have available, um, we have a little bit uh, over $8.5 million um, is what our current estimate is, about eight million five hundred and fifteen thousand dollars ish so I say that um, because we'll go through these four projects, uh, you know, tonight uh, here at the board meeting, um, and I'll just kind of give you the the number in advance, but I'll we'll break it out as we go through. Uh, but the projects uh, that we're looking uh, for approval to take out to bid tonight uh, are about eight uh, eight million one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. So that leaves us about three hundred sixty five thousand dollars remaining um, in our various bond accounts um, kind of you know as a buffer uh, in in reserve so to speak based upon what our current you know architects and engineering you know estimates are now uh, obviously uh, you know we tend to try to be on the conservative side of things uh, and so not only is is there that reserve that's there 
but obviously we've got reserve and contingency built into every single one of these individual projects. Um, and so we're trying to be ultra conservative uh, in terms of you know taking these projects out for bid. Um, quite honestly, um, our hope is that if all of these projects come in and get bid, you know either at or below uh, what we're currently budgeting. Uh, we do have one more project uh, that we would like to take out to bid um, yet sometime late spring uh, and that would be uh, uh, renovating or, or repaving uh, the TLLC parking lot uh, downtown. That was the only uh, facility, the only parking lot that we did not touch uh, with our bond dollars thus far. And we did that on purpose uh, because it, you know, we knew that we were going to be doing some work um, on the site. And quite frankly, we didn't want heavy equipment uh, down there uh, and and uh, and do damage. So, and with the current estimates that we have for that project, um, if everything that we present tonight comes in on budget, we believe we would still have adequate funds to get that project done um, as well. But like I said, it's it's kind of our buffer right now, um, and uh, we're being conservative. But just to kind of give you the overall context um, of where we stand budget-wise, uh, and quite frankly, it's it's uh, you know uh, very favorable um, for us, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know something that uh, will benefit the community, uh, you know, and us as a school district, uh, well into the future for you know 25 to 30 years if we can get some of these uh, projects done now. So with that, I will jump into. First one here, which will be our roofing projects. And hoping everybody can see that. If I can just get a confirmation, that would be great. Good to go. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, in the resolutions, uh, we are actually going to be taking these two projects out as separate bids, but they're basically the same concept. And so I've, I've kind of grouped them together from a presentation standpoint. Uh, but uh, our Meadowview and Aiken Road uh, roofs, uh, we've had them uh, looked at a number of times uh, over the past three to five years. Uh, and we knew that uh, we were kind of pushing it uh, when it came to uh, needing to have them replaced. So uh, just some, and I may not read through all of this uh, verbatim, but, uh, you know, uh, we've had continuing continuous water uh, issues, water penetration issues on both of these roofs, um, and the issues are becoming uh, more frequent and more significant or severe. Um, uh, you know, it's it's kind of uh, a little bit like uh, you know throwing the rolling the dice here uh, in terms of having a catastrophic failure, which is something that we want to try to avoid at all costs because, unfortunately, water damage inside of a building can get very expensive very quickly. Um, and so we're trying to avoid that. Um, both of these roofs are uh, rubber roofs. That's the, you know, so EPDM style, which is basically a rubber roof. Um, they are different in terms of the way that they are currently on the buildings. Uh, Meadowview, if you uh, were able to take a look at it from above, uh, you would see that there's a bunch of rock uh, on top of the, the roof at Meadowview. It's a ballasted roof, uh, which means that the, the rubber membrane is not really physically adhered. Um, to the insulation below. It uses the rocks to keep it down. Uh, not uncommon, uh, but then the other thing that that allows for you to see quite quickly uh, when you go up there uh, is that that membrane, when it gets old, it loses its elasticity and it starts to shrink. And so what happens is uh, it will start to pull away from the edges uh, of the roof uh, and literally slope down towards it. And so that's oftentimes where we start to see our failure um, is as it shrinks, it literally will start to tear um, at the edges. And so we've been battling that the last couple of years. Uh, we've had to make patches, um, had to do some uh, work, um, actually had to go up and start cutting the roof, uh, cutting the membrane apart a little bit uh, so we can put big patches in so that we don't get a, a significant failure. Um, Aiken Road is a little bit different in that it's still a rubber roof, um, but it is actually adhered via adhesive um, to the insulation below it. Uh, so you wouldn't see any rock or anything like that up there. Uh, but we still run into the same issues uh, where over time uh, the rubber just breaks down uh, primarily due to uh, UV rays, uh, so on and so forth, uh, becomes brittle, uh, starts to shrink, 
And then when that happens, you start to get cracks and tears uh, in that membrane, uh, and then you're chasing leaks um, all the time. So, and as I mentioned, there's there's some spots on that roof uh, where you can't even tell where the original roof was anymore because there's there's so many patches in it, and you're just it's it's really hard to start chasing down leaks when you've got so many patches. Um, so, as a general overview to these projects, uh, what we would be looking to do uh, would be to remove um, that existing rubber uh, rubber roof. Um, and the ballast, so all of the rock um, off of the roof at, at Meadowview. Uh, we would need to uh, remove um, some insulation on both roofs. There are a couple of smaller sections um, that there is no fire rated uh, base layer uh, there, which is now a code requirement. So sometimes codes change and when you make modifications or updates or changes to things, uh, you have to meet new code requirements. So that would mean that they would have to take the insulation all the way down, the roof all the way down to the, the steel deck. Um, we would have to install that uh, fire rated base layer um, in those spaces and then install new insulation over the top of that. And it says mechanically install uh, because that is important. Uh, when you go away from a ballasted roof, uh, you have to uh, literally take uh, large screws um, and anchor plates and uh, drill them into the metal deck. Um, otherwise, there's nothing to hold the roof down. Um, and so literally, um, it, the, the roof can become a big sail, a balloon, and uh, lift the roof and the insulation right off of it. Um, uh, where there is fire uh, rated base layers, um, we will try to reuse all of the existing insulation that's there, um, and we will put new insulation down over the top of that. Um, the parapet, which is kind of like the outer rim um, of the roof, uh, has kind of some sh a sheet metal cap and flashing that's there. Uh, we will have to reinstall the cap. Uh, and I bring that up um, because sometimes there's there's metal flashing that goes down a little bit below that. Um, and that we will not be replacing. So sometimes you get a little bit of color variation that's there, so it might not match exactly. Um, Metaview um, also has some uh, additional issues with some flashing that we're going to have to be rectified. Won't go into all the details of it, but just some things that uh, we need to fix uh, that uh, in the original design of the building are, are problematic. Um, these roofs will both be 25-year uh, uh, full warrantied roofs. Um, life expectancy on these roofs is greater than 30 years. So uh, uh, as I mentioned before, this, this will hopefully get um, all of our roofs in the entire district uh, well beyond that 25-year uh, mark from now. Uh, so we will be in a, a very good position district-wide. Um, and then there are some insulation code requirements that have changed. Um, so we will be adding some insulation, uh, which will also uh, then improve you know, some of our energy efficiency pieces. And then just to give you an idea as to how much uh, we're talking about, um, a square is, a, is 100 square feet. Uh, so you can see the you know, metal view, obviously, uh, a larger building. Uh, than Aiken Road, and that will translate into the differences in costs that you'll see here in a little bit. And then just also as a reminder, we do have some kindergarten uh, additions that were put on, and neither of those two kindergarten additions um, are obviously in the scope of this project as those roofs are relatively new. Um, not going to read through all of this, but this uh, basically shows a uh, schematic here of, of Meadowview. Um, those areas that are the A marked areas, uh, that's those are the spaces that will uh, basically the roof will come, the existing roof will come off, um, and then new insulation will put, be put down, and then the roof on top. There's a small section B up there, kind of in the top left hand corner. Uh, that's where uh, we're missing some fire rating, uh, and that roof will have to basically be stripped down to the metal decking and then rebuilt uh, back up all the way. Uh, the C areas are uh, areas that are canopies, basically, um, that don't really have a lot for code requirements and insulation value requirements. Um, so there's just a little bit of work that needs to be done on those. And then over on the right-hand side, uh, where it says no re-roofing, that is the kindergarten edition at Meadowview. Uh, Aiken Road, kind of a similar uh, thing there. So the A's uh, basically take off the existing, put some new insulation on to get it up to code. Uh, put the new rubber roof on. Uh, area B has to go all the way down to the metal deck and then build it back up. Uh, the C areas there, once again, canopies um, that don't, they're being that they're not internal, uh, not much for code requirements there. 
And then over on the left-hand side there, that is the new kindergarten addition at Aiken Road that will not be touched. Uh, so from a scheduling standpoint, obviously today, uh, looking for the board's permission to take uh, these two projects out for bid. Um, we would be looking to have our bid opening um, on April 6th, which is a uh, Tuesday, uh, and then back to the board, um, assuming that we get uh, you know, bids that we are comfortable with um, and are within you know, our budget uh, for board approval to award the contracts. And then we would be looking to begin work um, as soon as school is out in June uh, with the projects uh, being significantly complete uh, before students uh, return in August. Um, so construction cost estimates uh, uh, at Meadow, Meadowview, uh, about 2.6 million is our estimate and Aiken Road at about 1.6 uh, for a total of $4.2 million between those two roofs um, with those expected uh, funding source to be from our 2015 uh, bond dollars. So I guess with that, well, this may be kind of quick or maybe not quick enough for some, <laughs> um, if you have any questions. All right, Member Simmons, I see you have your hand up. Thanks, Dan, for the overview. I have two questions. Yes. The first is the, first is the timeline, um, six days for between bid opening and when the board would award contracts. Is that is that typical? That seems like a short amount of time. So, uh, so yes, it, it, uh, it's not atypical. Um, so what, what that would mean then is, so our bid opening, so the, the um, so the engineers have assured me that, because uh, what I relay to them is that I need to be able to have, um, you know, letters of, uh, you know, recommendation letters, so on and so forth, um, you know, to Miss Jensen uh, by four o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, so they can hit the board packet. Um, so you know they they'll have enough time. Uh, we're we're opening bids uh, in the morning on the Tuesday. Uh, so they will have the remainder of the workday um, on Tuesday and Wednesday, um, you know, to do any checking that they need to. And, and quite honestly, um, you know, obviously we don't know for sure um, who's going to bid the job, um, but uh, jobs of this size, uh, that there aren't a lot of contractors that are out there that will um, bid on these. Um, and so most of the time, it's just them doing their due diligence um, regarding whether or not, uh, A, that the, the uh, contractor will hold to their bid value. Um, sometimes we run into concerns if, if we end up with some outlier that's really low, um, that they miss, you know, that they miss bid it um, in some way, shape or form. Um, I, I haven't experienced that. Uh, you know, in the district and any of the any of the projects that I've worked on thus far, but it could happen. Um, you know, and so if if that sort of a thing happened, then we would have to adjust the schedule. But uh, right now, we we don't have any reason to believe um, that they wouldn't be able to you know uh, take a look at what those bids are um, compared to our estimates uh, and make any follow up calls. Um, you know, to put it to put anybody at ease for accepting those bids. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. And then my second question is for each of these buildings. Um,
monitor uh, those exit and entrance uh, types of sites uh, so that we are as safe as we can be. And if we have any concerns with that um, because of uh, programming going, going on, um, then we can also have them uh, install overhead, uh, you know, kind of uh, overhead protection. You know, especially if you're walking like downtown Minneapolis or St. Paul or something, you'll see sometimes where they force you to actually walk through kind of like a little tunnel uh, that's made out of scaffolding. Um, so if we have any concerns, uh, that's another uh, avenue that we would have to go. But there will there will be some noise. Um, the, the nice thing about uh, these types of roofs, though, is that there's uh, if you do a built up roof, which is kind of like the liquid tar, um, then you also get a lot of smell. Um, and that's not the case with these roofs. So that's another benefit. Uh, what this type of a roof is, is you don't have those uh, fumes and, and that kind of a disruption. So. Thanks. And sorry, just one more to yep. follow up to what you just shared. If any of the contractors or people that would be working on site would require access to the building, would they be subject to the same security measures that anyone else entering the building would be? Or could you tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the expectation would be that they would have to go into the main office. Um, and quite honestly, uh, I, boy, barring, barring some emergency, quite honestly, they are never in the buildings. Um, uh, they, in fact, they don't even like to come in the buildings. Um, so they, you know, they typically, you know, they, they'll have their own, you know, restroom facilities and stuff like that, that they'll bring on site. Um, and then they usually typically uh, will utilize ladders um, to access the roof. Um, they uh, seems to be a thing with roofing contractors. They just try to avoid, um, you know, coming into to buildings if they can at all, you know, uh, avoid it. Okay, thanks a lot. Yep. All right, I can't see everyone on my screen. Are there any other comments or questions or are we ready to take a motion? All right, hearing none. Oh, Kyle, do you have a question? Are you ready to take the motion? Go ahead. I'll, take the motion. I'll move to grant the administration in conjunction with INSPEC permission to create an issue uh, bid proposal for Aiken Road Elementary and Meadowview Elementary roof replacement as presented. Second. Motion by Christensen, second by Doyle. Roll call vote, please. Member Simmons? Yes. Member Christensen? Yes. Member Carraro? <laughs> Member Doyle? Yes. Member Coletta? Yes. Chair Saucer? Yes, motion passes all in favor of it. And just to, for the record right now, Steve's having audio issues. He did have a thumbs up to vote for that as for that motion. All right, the next item of business continues with Mr. Miller with the Farmington High School Tennis Courts Project. All right, thank you, Chair Saucer, member of, of the board. Um, yes, yeah, so jumping right into a uh, tennis court project at the high school um, for a little bit of uh, recap on that. Um, our current uh, tennis facilities are located at Dodge Middle School uh, and Bachman Middle School. Uh, the Dodge facility is used primarily by our middle school programs, uh, and that uh, existing surface is uh, in really, really rough shape. Um, it's it's uh, pretty much beyond repair uh, and, quite honestly, uh, not really playable. Uh, the Bachman uh, Middle School uh, site is, is what we use as our varsity and junior varsity uh, facility. Um, it's in relatively good condition. Uh, we did have the surface redone. Uh, in, two, in the summer of 2017, uh, you know, it's, it's not perfect, uh, but it's in, in pretty decent condition. So when we started talking about uh, the need uh, to do something uh, with the second site, basically what, what Dodge is right now, uh, the options were really, uh, do we take and uh, completely reconstruct uh, that existing space at Dodge? Um, or uh, do we look at uh, constructing uh, and building uh, new courts at the high school? And so after conversation, uh, you know, with the admin team, uh, you know, building administration, um, our athletic department, uh, it really seemed to make sense uh, for lots of different reasons uh, to uh, construct a site if we're basically going to have to start from scratch, uh, with the exception of the fencing. The fencing is obviously there. Um, 
we'd have to take it down um, in order to do construction. Uh, but uh, it made sense to do it at the high school uh, and actually have the varsity um, facility be on the high school campus. Um, there's a lot of uh, ownership um, and ease, and then we don't have, we're not having uh, students have to drive and commute, um, you know, to that location um, over at Bachman. And so we had that conversation, um, decided to look into, uh, from a budgetary standpoint, uh, what that would, you know, whether or not it was feasible to do that. Um, had engineers and architects take a look at that um, and believe that, in fact, uh, we would have the funds um, to create a new uh, facility at the high school uh, versus uh, basically starting over again um, at Dodge uh, and having the, the facility uh, at the middle schools. And then uh, the idea then being that uh, the middle school program uh, would shift to the Bachman facility, uh, which is in, in relatively good condition. So just for a little bit of context uh, and site reference here for folks. Uh, so this is uh, just a, a, a Google, uh, satellite image of the very north uh, end of campus at the high school. Uh, you can see the baseball fields there um, on the bottom, on the south side, and then the three softball fields on the north side of the campus there. And then over on the right uh, is the area um, where the uh, tennis courts uh, would be slated to go. And just for reference for folks, um, this, this uh, area is uh, where the tennis courts uh, in the original site plan for the high school uh, were slated uh, to go. Um, so just for some additional context there. So in working with um, a couple of different uh, engineering groups, uh, so BKBM does a lot of uh, work in consult with Wald Architects and Engineering uh, when it comes to uh, earthwork and so on and so forth. Uh, so they have been heavily, heavily involved in this uh, as well as Wold. Uh, we're looking at eight courts that would be oriented uh, north and south. So uh, the, on the right-hand the right side uh, of this picture would be north. Uh, the left-hand side would be south. Uh, so they would be uh, that orientation uh, located just east of the existing baseball fields and west of, a, of the walking path that loops around there. Uh, we would be looking to create a natural windbreak on the west side of the of the courts uh, that are there. Uh, we are uh, doing some enhanced uh, stormwater uh, runoff treatment. If you look closely, I apologize, it, it's, a, it's a little bit hard to see some of the detail um, on the diagram because it's a little bit small, uh, but there are some, I don't really want to call them retaining ponds. Um, it, it's more of kind of like your, your rain garden type of an approach. Uh, where it's a collecting pool um, that would allow uh, water to run off in those spaces. Um, there would be some paved uh, areas on, this, on the uh, east side there, which so that would be towards the bottom, uh, right underneath the courts, uh, just for some spectator seating. Um, a, a fence around, uh, obviously at the tennis court, so a 10 foot uh, fence around. Uh, the color scheme, uh, similar to what we currently have over at Bachman, um, would incorporate our official uh, colors. They're able to, to do that in terms of the orange anyway. Uh, the required earthwork, so there will have to be a fair amount of excavation here um, to get rid of uh, some of the clay soil uh, underneath, which is not conducive to uh, creating a stable slab. Um, so because of that, uh, we also wanted to capitalize uh, on that earthwork and make some corrections to our softball fields uh, one and three, um, which are currently not regulation size. I don't know why, um, we're not sure why, uh, but when they were designed, um, they are not uh, long enough fields and they require some fill uh, in order to get them up to grade. Uh, so we figured that this would be an opportune time uh, to uh, take the fill that we're gonna have to move um, out from the tennis court area there um, and move it over uh, to the uh, outfields in those areas uh, so that we don't have to truck fill in, uh, so it saves us money. Um, and then because uh, the contractor won't have to haul as much fill out, um, also uh, uh, less transportation costs uh, on them to move that fill out of here. Um, let's do that. That's kind of that piece. 
Um, proposed schedule. Uh, so actually this is very similar uh, to the roof piece. So obviously asking for permission um, to take that project out to bid. Uh, we would be looking to have the bid opening uh, for this particular project uh, immediately after the other one. Um, looking for uh, board approval on the uh, April 12th board meeting. Uh, and then this one, um, we would look to begin work as soon as weather you know, permits. Uh, you know, we'll see how things go here in the spring. If, if the weather stays warm and things dry out, uh, we'll start as soon as we can. Um, I've been in communication and contact with uh, Mr. Cheetah, our AD, as well as high school staff, uh, you know, regarding um, that's the, the area out there in terms of softball use and so on and so forth. Um, and it was their preference um, to uh, get going on this project as quickly as we can. Uh, with the hopes that we can get everything wrapped up in uh, late summer um, and then that everything would be uh, playable uh, in in the fall. Uh, and so that was, we had some flexibility in terms of the timeline uh, and they opted that they would prefer to get it done sooner than later. Uh, and then, so that's the uh, August 13th uh, significant completion date that's there. Um, and then from a construction cost estimate, uh, so we would be looking at um, an estimate of about $1.2 million uh, to do that. So that's uh, inclusive of the tennis courts, obviously, all of the landscaping, stuff like that, uh, earthwork uh, that, you, that uh, was in that diagram. Uh, and then the moving and grading of that, uh, of the fill uh, to uh, make those uh, softball fields uh, able to be regulation size. And this would also uh, be funded out of the remaining 2015 bond dollars. So with that, I would take any questions that people have. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, is there a motion? I move to uh, grant the administration uh, in conjunction with Wold Architects and Engineers and BKBM Engineers, uh, permission to create and issue a bid proposal for the Farmington High School tennis courts as presented. Second. Second. Motion by, second by Carrero. I'm glad your mics work at. came through. All right. All right. Roll call vote. <laughs> Member Christensen? Yes. Member Carrero? Yes. Member Doyle? Yes. Member Coletta? Yes. Member Simmons? Yes. Chair Saucer? Yes. Motion passes. Permission to go ahead with the bid for that process. Next project, Tiger Legacy and Learning Center window and door replacement project. Go ahead, Mr. Miller. All right, thank you once again. Uh, so continuing to move along here pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, as you recall, um, we just did a, a relatively major mechanical uh, update uh, to our TLLC center downtown. Um, and uh, we'd like to continue uh, working on that building to kind of get it up to uh, where all of the rest of our facilities are. Uh, and so that uh, would involve some uh, window and door replacement um, at that site. Um, if we would have known quite honestly uh, that the project bids and stuff like that would have come in um, as they did uh, originally on that project, we, we probably would have entertained this notion of trying to lump these two together. Uh, but quite honestly, um, we didn't expect that that was uh, going to be a, a, a viable uh, path to take. Um, so it, it's actually, uh, I'm quite thrilled actually that uh, we're even in a position to have this conversation about uh, using dollars that we already had um, to to move forward with this. So uh, the the newer section of the building, which is not all that new, uh, but 1961, uh, still has all of the original single pane windows um, and doors uh, in that building. Then uh, many of them are in, in pretty rough shape. Uh, the 1913 and 29 sections of the building uh, kind of have a combination uh, of, of newer windows. Um, uh, well, newer than 1961. Uh, and then uh, some of the solid infill panes that were, uh, you know, kind of done in the, uh, 
you know, 80s, 90s ish, uh, kind of for energy efficiency standpoint. So basically, they, you know, filled in all of the uh, openings, all the window openings. Uh, instead of putting glass in them, they just put in some insulated panels. Uh, there are a number of exterior doors in both sections of the building that have been replaced um, in recent years because, quite honestly, they just were no longer operable and we didn't really have a choice. Uh, and so those doors uh, would not be in the scope uh, of this project. We're, we're not going to take doors that have been recently replaced and, and replace them again. Um, the, uh, new windows uh, in this building uh, will not be operable, meaning they will not open and close. Um, almost all of the windows right now in that building uh, just about do open and close. And uh, quite honestly, it's probably a good thing that they did because uh, it was the only way to regulate temperature in that building. Uh, so. Uh, we will no longer be in that position um, uh, that we will need operable windows. And, and quite frankly, it, it works very counter uh, to uh, maintaining uh, a healthy climate inside of a building uh, to have those windows open and close. Uh, let's see, moving on. Um, so uh, from a design criteria, uh, when we started looking at, you know, what do we want this to look like? Uh, you know, when it comes to the actual design component, uh, we wanted to maintain the historical character uh, of the older section of the building. Um, it's obviously it's a, it's a one of a kind building. It's it's got uh, a tremendous amount of uh, workmanship uh, and, and uh, you know exemplary trades that worked on that building a hundred years ago, uh, and it's kind of hard to match that today. Uh, but we wanted to try uh, to do that. Um, both on the exterior windows and then on the inside um, on, the, on the trim work. Uh, we also wanted to try to improve the appearance and character of that 1961 portion of the building um, in the new window design. Uh, I think that's one of the things that really sticks out in that building to people that you know, look at it is that they're just so diametrically opposed in terms of the design aspects of, of both of those uh, buildings. We wanted to try to figure out how can we potentially you know, blend that together a little bit more uh, than what's currently there. Um, and then the other piece that uh, is important just as a, as a note is that we do need the new windows to be designed to accommodate the existing ceilings. Uh, most all of the ceilings uh, in the building are uh, below what the original heights uh, were uh, in that building uh, because of all of the additional uh, pieces of uh, HVAC system and so on and so forth that is in there that was not part of the original building. And so uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, you can see the ceilings uh, through the windows. So I uh, just wanted to present a few uh, kind of design renderings um, to give you an idea as to uh, what we're, uh, where we currently are with the design. Um, so uh, we're looking to go with a, a dark uh, mullion finish. Um, so the metal that's in the, in the uh, uh, in the windows would be kind of a dark bronze color. Uh, there would be some grid uh, in the upper portions of the windows. I, you can probably see it a little bit if you look closely. Um, and we wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. One is, is uh, those types of mullion grid would have been historically uh, accurate for this building. Um, and then the other thing is, is that it really provides a clear delineation um, in terms of where the ceilings fall uh, in that area of the building. So, so basically what it allows us to do is to create a really nice seamless architectural um, design element um, that kind of hides the ceilings because that the glass that would be in those um, grid would uh, be what they call a spandrel glass, uh, which you can't see through. So it looks like regular glass, um, but you can't see through it. And so it would hide the ceilings um, and make it and still give it that historically accurate um, aesthetics. Uh, say I already mentioned inoperable windows, um, the existing infill panels. So as I mentioned before, there are quite a number of these right now uh, that do not have glass in them. Um, so those old uh, panels, uh, infill panels would come out and they would be replaced with windows. Oops. Um, in the 1961 section of the building, um, uh, this is where we had a lot of conversation uh, with the architects um, and design and, and amongst our uh, uh, 
director group as well uh, pertaining to you know what how, how do we how do we make this part of the building um, a little bit more uh, have it give it a little bit more uh, character and yet try to figure out some way to blend it in with uh, the older section of the building uh, I should have I should have grabbed I'm realizing now I should have grabbed a picture of the current what it currently looks like um, so right now uh, for those of you that uh, maybe can't envision this, this building right now basically has uh, kind of raw finished aluminum uh, windows. So everything is, is silver. Um, and so we, we wanted to blend and make sure that our, our uh, window frames and our mullion finishes were, were the same and there was consistency between the two buildings. So that would be uh, the, that dark mullion finish. Uh, same thing with the, the approach of using the, the spandrel uh, glass in the upper and lower sections. Um, because in this part of the building, the lower sections of the windows, uh, there's actually, right now, there's just some panels that are in there. Uh, they're very low quality um, insulation panels. Um, so we would be looking to replace those with glass, uh, but there is some casework um, and some radiators along those walls. Uh, so we would need to hide those from the outside, uh, but we can do that with the glass. Um, the windows would be inoperable. Um, Right now, uh, we are leaning towards a, an alternate uh, kind of mullion pattern. So you can see that it's not your, uh, just your traditional straight up and down uh, rectangular uh, panes of glass. Uh, it would be smaller panes of glass kind of in some uh, quasi, you know, random, uh, you know, geometric arrangement um, to give it a little bit uh, of additional character um, that right now it, it currently doesn't have. Um, try to give it some character in comparison to uh, the older sections of the building. Um, let's see what else. And uh, it, it might be a little bit hard to see uh, in there as well, but in within that uh, pattern, uh, some of those uh, little squares of glass um, have some color uh, to them. Um, kind of a, uh, let's see how, a kind of a muted um, type of a more of a primary uh, color uh, to them. Uh, we don't have exact colors uh, picked out yet, um, something that we're still uh, working on. We want it to be something that uh, is, is as timeless as we can get it, something that kind of follows um, kind of some color wheel theory uh, and so on and so forth. So that's, uh, that's something that the uh, engineering team is uh, still nailing down in terms of the exact specifications um, on what that would look like. Um, uh, proposed schedule here, um, kind of looking at the same thing uh, with this one. Um, of any of them, I could see potentially um, that this one might, uh, we may not be able to get this one back quite this quickly. Um, we're, we're trying to continue to push forward as, as, as much as we can. Uh, so as of right now, this is what we're trying to go with. Um, but if we needed to push the bid open date back a little bit uh, and bring this back to the board at the end of April, um, just that there's a possibility that that might that that may be the case. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of the same sort of a schedule uh, as some of the others. This one, uh, we would look to begin work uh, in May. Uh, we have some flexibility uh, in this building to select spaces uh, that would not be. Um, disruptive uh, to folks that are in there. And some of these areas are actually used uh, more at night than during the day. So uh, we can kind of work a schedule that would allow contractors to be in spaces um, and, and not be disruptive um, to uh, activities uh, and instruction that's going on. And then this project uh, would be looking for significant completion um, in September um, and once again, uh, kind of phased and we've got some flexibility because uh, they would basically be taking windows out and then replacing them. So we wouldn't be demoing everything out and leaving it. Um, would be kind of like take it out, put it back in uh, as quickly as, as, uh, as we can. So I know that was a lot, um, but I guess I will take any questions that folks have. Member Christensen, I see your hand is raised. Do you have the floor? I don't know if I have questions. I just have a comment that I think it's pretty remarkable to have a building that uh, 
was put together in 1913, still getting this kind of life out of it. So I think that's pretty great. And I know you didn't have a picture of what uh, the 1961 section looks like right now, but I did while you were speaking, run out to Google Maps and did the street view. <laughs> <clears throat> and and that would be that would be quite a facelift um, for for what that looks like right now in a real um, and actually just a nice way to really upgrade the look for that neighborhood um, and and for the community. So um, yeah, if it comes in close to that, that look really nice. That's it. Thank you. And that and that and I will just comment that was that was one of the things that we we discussed as an administration. I mean, obviously, you know, the the building, you know belongs to the school district but you know that building and that site is just such a you know kind of an anchor point um you know to the downtown community and uh yes i i we i think we would agree it is and i've dropped off my kids for gymnastics and little ninjas and little things like you know stuff like that so i know there's yeah. a lot of activity in that that uh, that building so anyway uh, yeah. remarkable amount of detail too dan i appreciate it Does anyone have any other questions or comments? I have to admit, I Googled mullion. That was a new word for me. So I learned all about that during your presentation as well, Dan. So I appreciate you continuing to educate us on more facility and architectural terms. So I'm enlightened tonight. Is sorry, there I, got ahead of, I got ahead of myself here even. I realized I didn't put the budget number up there. So there oh, it is, sorry. <laughs> and this one, actually, I should clarify. So this one, uh, we would utilize all of the remaining uh, funds out of the LTFM bond fund for this project, because we have to keep the money on this project at this site. So that we would start and drain that account all the way down. Uh, and then the remaining dollars that it would take to finish to, for the project would come out of the 2015 bond. So sorry about that. No problem. You've got a lot to share tonight. Seeing no other questions, is there a motion? <sighs> I'll make a motion to grant administration in conjunction with world architects and engineers permission to create and issue a bid proposal for the TLLC window and door replacement project as presented. Second. Motion by Carraro, second by Doyle. Roll call vote, please. Member Carraro? Yes. Member Doyle? Yes. Member Coletta? Yes. Member Simmons? Yes. Member Christensen? Yes. Chair Doy, uh, Chair Saucer? Sorry. Yes, no worries. Motion passes. We have approval for the bid on the TLLC. All right. Our next item of business with Mr. Miller again is the <sighs> high school extension of 2000, no, 202nd Street. Go ahead. All right. Okay. So this is the last one, I promise. All right. Uh, this, one, this one is. Uh, I mean, all of them are kind of exciting, but this this one um, is is really going to uh, uh, make a significant difference at our high school campus uh, when it comes to traffic flow. Uh, so, as you're aware, um, we have there is a development um, happening right now in Lakeville um, off of Cedar, which immediately uh, is adjacent to uh, our high school property, and uh, knowing that uh, and the uh, planned road development uh, through that uh, housing development, uh, working with the city of Lakeville and the city of Farmington, uh, we really wanted to try to pursue uh, getting traffic patterns, getting the roadways and the traffic patterns established uh, for the residents in that in those neighborhoods um, as soon as possible. And so, um, our current traffic flow options at the high school, if if you've you know, ever tried to leave after a football game on a Friday night, uh, you know, a couple of years ago anyway, not recently, but a couple of years ago, uh, you're, you're, you know, very much aware that, uh, you know, our, our options are very limited uh, to a north entrance and a south exit. Uh, so with the future planning, uh, there is going to be an east-west extension of 202nd Street that goes from Cedar Avenue um, and, uh, and connects to Flagstaff. Uh, and that is in the in the city of Farmington comp plan. Uh, the extension happening right now from Cedar Avenue through that Cedar Hill second uh, addition development, and uh, they they continue to go to town out there. Uh, you know, equipment is is sitting out there on the site. As you come across 202nd Street now, you can see them putting in uh, roadways and stuff like that uh, before winter hit. Um, so the idea is 
uh, that uh, with this, then we would have, uh, uh, long term anyway, we would have two drive connections uh, from the FHS campus to 202nd Street um, that are in the original site plan. We're not in a position to do that right now, uh, nor do we think that we you know, necessarily need to. Uh, but when that road goes all the way through to Flagstaff at some point, then we would look to add uh, an additional drive um, as well. It would kind of go uh, beside the tennis courts that I showed you earlier. Um, so this uh, kind of gives you a schematic in terms of reference point. Um, so on the far left, I included just a little bit of the uh, Cedar Hills development plan that's there. Uh, and then on the kind of in the center section there, you can see in the black lines uh, where the extension would be from our uh, existing drive that kind of dead ends down there by that parking lot. Uh, we would be extending that drive and it kind of uh, bends to the right there a little bit to the east and then would connect up with uh, that road extension. Uh, and the tricky part here is that, you know, we've, we've got three different entities involved. Uh, you know, the city of Lakeville uh, will be involved up until their border. Uh, and then the city of Farmington has to take over um, at, the, this, at the city line there. And then you've got the, you know, us as a school district uh, being involved in trying to connect a private roadway, a private drive uh, to that city of Farmington Road. Um, but we believe we've got all of the, uh, the details worked out. Um, in order to get this uh, done. And uh, all three entities are committed to doing that. So uh, this is a little bit uh, bigger schematic here. Uh, it's kind of switch directions on you though. So to the right is south, uh, left is north. And you can see the idea being right now in terms of from the city of Farmington's perspective, uh, the, the intent is to get just enough of this road in uh, so that the high school that we can connect the drive to it. So that's so for right now, you'll see that there's a turnaround circle in there. Um, and it's that's all it is. Um, it's just a turnaround circle so that people, if they come that direction, they can turn around, uh, making sure that we've got enough clearance and so on and so forth for plow trucks uh, and, and the like. Let's see. So, um, Oh, and then uh, also as part of this, um, uh, this uh, this 202nd Street extension, once it's uh, once it's complete, uh, it will have pedestrian trails on both sides of the road, and so we're trying to be proactive uh, here and be as efficient as we can, uh, and so uh, we are putting a pedestrian walkway uh, path on the what would be the east side, so uh, kind of on the top side of this diagram right now, there would be a walking path. Uh, that would come all the way down and then connect with paved surface um, on the high school campus. Um, um, or, oh, yep, go ahead, Steve. So uh, who will maintain that road once it's complete, Dan? Which, uh, the driveway or the actual, or the, or the actual 202nd Street? 202nd Street. So, so, um, so that, so the city of Lakeville and the city of Farmington are working that out right now. Um, it, Eventually, when it connects to Flagstaff, um, it will be maintained by the city of Farmington. But uh, what, they're, what they've come to an agreement on is because there is not really a through access point. Um, so when it comes to specifically right now for snow removal purposes, the city of Lakeville would maintain that um, and then basically bill back uh, the city of Farmington. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so uh, with this project, this is a little bit different um, in that um, all of these uh, different pieces uh, are kind of being lumped together, um, you know, jointly with the city of Lakeville, city of Farmington, and the school district. And so uh, really what, what uh, we're looking for um, is, is permission to take this out to bid. Uh, the city of Lakeville is actually the entity that will formally be taking uh, these projects out for bid. Um, and then what would happen is we would bring back um, to the board, uh, we're, we're, we're planning on the 12th right now. Um, I'm waiting for confirmation from the city of Farmington that some of these things will meet their city council timelines um, uh, for approval to award the contract 
as well as um, the joint powers agreements that we would have with the city of Lakeville and the city of Farmington as it would pertain to this project. So basically what that outlines is, you know, our financial um, obligations to the city of Lakeville, which is where all of the funds would be funneled through uh, because they would, they would be the one that would actually be administering the contracts. Um, so it would be kind of twofold uh, when we come back. Uh, to that. But that is one thing we, we wanted to do that. We wanted to have the same engineering group, the same engineering teams, the same design teams working on this entire project um, to just make it far more efficient, uh, much less opportunity for things to go awry uh, in terms of all of the all of the grading needs, um, all the timeline scheduling and that sort of a thing. Uh, and then uh, once uh, once that's is approved, then they would be looking to begin uh, the project as, as soon as weather permits. Uh, you know, right now they're estimating in late April um, once everything is is signed off on uh, and we're ready to go. And it would uh, be anticipated uh, that the project would be complete um, in early September. Um, not doesn't necessarily impact uh, anything, uh, so to speak. You know, we don't have the drive right now, so we're not out anything. Um, and they would be working uh, coming from the north uh, to the south. So, uh, you know, would, wouldn't be interrupting, you know, traffic flow or, or, you know, student parking or anything like that. And um, the cost estimate um, on this uh, for that, for our, uh, for the district portion uh, is uh, being estimated at about $380,000. Um, and that would uh, also be coming out of the 2015 bond dollars. So I guess with that, I would take any questions. And I know, I'm sure Mr. Pickens would be happy if you were here to speak up and say how great this would be if we could have another way in and out of the high school. But I see a few questions. Yes. Uh, Member Coletta, why don't you go ahead first? Thank you. Dan, I'm just curious. I know in a previous uh, workshop session that the board had um, uh, last year, we were discussing also expanding the parking lot. Is that still on the radar to get additional parking spaces? And where are we at with that? Um, so, of, uh, yep. So if, if I recall correctly, so I think that was, um, so, uh, so the, the, the short answer to that is no. Um, we, that was, um, at that point in time, we were looking to uh, expand the parking on the west side of the stadium uh, behind uh, the uh, home, uh, uh, the, basically the home uh, side of the stadium. Um, right now, uh, we've kind of scrapped that. Uh, it, you know, it would definitely be a, a, a nice to have uh, sort of a thing. There are some pros and cons both ways. Uh, to that, uh, but at this point in time, no, uh, we elected that these projects uh, really should take precedent and priority um, over that um, at this point in time anyway. So no, we do not have any plans in the immediate time frame to add uh, additional parking at the high school. Will you keep that in, in your toolbox, sort of say, for future projects, Dan? I know, um, there's not going to be an enormous amount of cost with maintaining this driveway or, or road into the into the school. And I know it's much needed, but it would be nice to have that additional revenue, no matter how small, to help uh, maintain the road from those parking permits. So hmm. if we could maybe, you know, you know, we've got a lot on our plate right now. I, I totally understand that, but if we could maybe entertain the you know, this idea at a later date, I would, I would love to, to do that. Yep. No, nope. thank you for the, the input. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, member Payan, go ahead. Um, so um, my question, I guess, and I couldn't really see, I guess, on the map, um, would this new like additional road and like um, leaving the high school, would that impact traffic? Um, like being heavier in those neighborhoods. I just know like when leaving the school day and even football games, as you mentioned, it is insanely busy with traffic. So just being like considerate in my eyes of the families in the neighborhoods, I'm just curious if the traffic is going to be increased heavily and 
like what is being done to maintain that? Yeah. So Grace, that's actually a, it's a, it's an excellent question, and that's and that's uh, and that and your question lends itself uh, very much to the reason why uh, the city of Farmington, the city of Lakeville, and us, but more so even the cities, um, wanted to do this now so that people that are moving into these neighborhoods um, understand that this is going to be the, the normal traffic pattern and traffic flow um, from the high school campus. Uh, it's, a, it's a little, you're right, it is a little bit hard to see. Um, I, I pulled up a, you know, I went back to that map. This road is gonna be actually a pretty decent sized uh, major collector road. Um, so it, it will, um, be you know 40 40 45 feet wide um the potential for you know two lanes turn lanes um that's not what's going in um on the lakeville side or i'm sorry on the farmington side right now um but going through the the, the development in lakeville um that road widens out quite a bit and i'm trying to think of a comparable um you know it's it's not I don't think it would be as wide as uh, Pilot Knob because that's a divided. Um, well, I'm trying to think of another road here in town that would be a good example. Um, you know, maybe maybe something a little bit more size, uh, like 195th Street past Meadowview or something, uh, where it's a pretty pretty wide road. Um, and so it's it's not going to be like you know a road that's just going through you know purely a residential uh, neighborhood. This would be the back of people's yards and so on and so forth. Um, but that is one of the reasons why they wanted to do this now, uh, because the last thing that they wanted was this road is going to go in someday and these drives are going to be connected. Um, and what they didn't want to have happen is for people to all of a sudden say, wait a minute, where's all this traffic coming from? We never knew about this. Um, that way there's, there's you know, the, the city and the developer can clearly articulate um, and show and there really won't be any surprises once people get in and get settled. Perfect, thank you, that's helpful. Can I just clarify, so you're saying that that you're just gonna have basically the back, back sides of houses, it's not gonna be your driveways or entering and exiting, it's just gonna be more of a main road? Yeah, so if you can, it's, it's yeah. I apologize, it's a little bit hard to see, but basically, yeah. Yes, it, yes, yep. to your point, it is yep. a, it's gonna be a major yep. intersection between and it's it, Dan, right? It's supposed to connect even beyond into Farmington. It, I mean, that's yes. uh, the long term yes. plan of that thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this road eventually is going to go all the way through Farmington and connect over to the, the long term plan. We're talking like 2050 comp plan, I believe, is that this road would diagonal down and actually then connect with 208th Street, um, is, like through the park. And then, like, so, like, literally over by Dodge, yep. you know, over by Dodge and Riverview, that's 208th Street. So it connect all the way through there, and then it's designed to actually continue out 208th Street, where you know where Riverview dead ends right now, and go through that and connect over with County Road 66 and go all the way out to Highway 52. So it'd have to cross the railroad so, track and stuff. Yeah. So it's a big time thing. So this is yeah, this is a major you know 25 years down the road, significant you know east west corridor. We don't have many of those, so those are, that oh, would yeah. be yeah. yeah. No. All right. Are there any other questions or comments? I can't see anyone, everyone on my screen. So go ahead if you want, if you have anything else to add. If there's anyone. No, I can. Any other questions? All right. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to grant administration in conjunction with the city of Lakeville and the city of Farmington permission to create and issue a bid proposal for the FHS drive extension to 202 202nd Street, excuse me, as presented. Second. Motion by Carrero, second by Coletta. Roll call vote, please. Member Coletta? Yes. Member Simmons? Yes. Member Christensen? Yes. Member Carraro? Yes. Member Doyle? Yes. Chair Saucer? Yes. Motion passes on the bid for the future street. All right, the next item of business is our policy discussion. I'm assuming it's with the policy committee. I, Lori, are you leading this or Hannah, or I'm not sure who's leading the discussion tonight. Or Marianne, my apologies. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you, Marianne.
Still can't hear you. You might want to try back in maybe. I don't know what's going on tonight. I can kind of pick up, Marianne. Um, the policy committee met and we had discussed the, let me bring it up really quick, I apologize. Um, and we had discussed the following policies, six, 16 school district system accountability policy, 620 credit for learning and policy 1017 graduation requirements, formerly the MSBA policy 613. Um, there were uh, several amendments and word changes to these policies that were discussed by the team. Um, we did have questions regarding some of the wording on two of the policies. For policy 616, um, we learned, thank you, Lori and, and Marianne for getting this to us, that it is a direct quote from Minnesota statutes 120B.11, world's best workforce. And also the question on policy 613 language is a direct quote from Minnesota statute um, 120B.30. So asking the board if you have any questions on these policies or any concerns um, with wording or just general questions. And just to clarify with the policy committee, and correct me if I'm wrong, the policy committee goes to the first reading, then it's brought back to the board for the second, and then we bring it back to the board the final time for the third when we approve the, the policy. So just to let everyone know, it's one of the first three times we've done policies with the entire board here. So just wanted to clarify that point. Are there any questions or comments for the committee? All right, I'm not seeing any. We can move forward. It's not seeing any other questions with those. All right, we'll go ahead and move forward and then we'll bring this back to the agenda once again for the final approval. That's right, I need to keep mine on mute. All right, let me go back to the agenda here. Well, we are to the conclusion of the meeting, but not without hearing from our board members at the table for their comments for a meeting tonight. So let's see, I'm just gonna go around the table here. Um, Member Simmons, would you like to start tonight? Thank you, Chair Saucer. I'll keep it short and sweet tonight. Thanks so much to the administration team and all of our presenters this evening for your detailed presentations and information. I'm really excited to have our secondary learners back in school full time and appreciate all of the flexibility and planning that you've put into making that happen. So, um, and thanks Grace and Alicia for your updates as always. I look forward to the good news from you and from Superintendent Berg every week. Thanks everyone. All right, Member Doyle. I'll keep it short and sweet too. Um, I just wanna say thank you to Dan for putting all of that stuff together. I know it's, I can only imagine the amount of work that goes into that. So thank you for that presentation. Um, and I'm just super excited to get all the learners back in buildings and I can't wait to, to hear how it goes once we have all the kiddos there. All right, um, member, member Pagan, would you like to go ahead? Sure, um, I would just like to thank um, Mr. Miller for his detailed presentation as well. Um, as a high school student who drives, um, I'm very happy that the um, driving situation is getting talked about. Um, it'll be exciting to see that, especially um, in the coming years, as well as the tennis courts and all the other uh, developments that are happening, super exciting to see. So thank you for that. Member Coletta. I would also like to thank Dan on his thoroughness and his presentation this evening. Um, I'm always impressed with how well him and Jane work together with our district to not only save the district and our taxpayers as, as much money as possible, but then at the end of the year to be able to, or, you know, the end of the fiscal year to say, hey, we've, we've managed this so well, we've got this pool 
that you know of funds that we need to use from the state and 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 other areas that we need to use and look at all the amazing things that we're going to be able to do with you know to our buildings with this this money so um thank you both to jane for her f fiscal um responsibilities and just um her talent in in our uh, financial area and for dan for his thoroughness and keeping our buildings looking nice and and dry um want to thank Chris Bussman and, and Lori and Marianne for all of your amazing help on the policy committee. Um, your thoroughness and explanation of the policies is greatly appreciated um, during our meetings. And I think it also really helps when we present that to the school board as far as the thoroughness and completeness of the, the policy. So I wanted to give you guys a shout out and say thank you for that. Member Wong, go ahead. Um, I too am going to uh, hop on the train of thinking, Mr. Miller. Um, I'm really excited for the tennis courts. I played tennis sophomore year before I got, had my knee surgery um, and I played at Dodge and it was great to have tennis courts to play as at play at, but there's definitely some uh, renovations that could be made. Um, I'm really excited to get back into school, um, get out of this lethargic state that I'm in and just, you know, get back into my old habits and ways of going about life. So thank you, everyone. Member Christensen. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, it's been by the time at the end of this month, it'll been over a year since uh, students have been in school full time across Farmington. I think that's pretty remarkable. Um, and so it's really, it is really exciting. It's awesome news. And I know it's a credit to the administrative leaders and, and our teachers for uh, persevering um, and all the students too, for persevering through a pretty, pretty tough, tough year. And um, I know there's a lot of impatience, including among, including myself, um, probably all too often, but it's, uh, I just, it, it's, it's great to see it. Um, it's good to feel and, and hear the excitement. Um, Jason mentioned earlier that um, some of the schools, the, the science fairs are, are, like I said, they're persevering. They're finding different ways to get things done. Um, same thing too. I've heard from a couple of different, couple of our elementary schools about their parent-teacher partnerships. They weren't able to do their fun runs in the fall, but they found other ways to do um, fundraising. What they do is they raise money for enrichment programs. Um, I know North Trail Elementary keeps its library open during the summer, and there's all um, alter, other cultural immersion opportunities that are funded through those programs. And I think it's awesome to see. Um, families and, and extended families continuing to step up even when um, maybe sometimes that's that's a little the, the context of the, the what we're living through right now is it, it kind of it, it changes maybe the expectation but it didn't really change the the generosity um, going on across our, our communities right now same thing with the consent agenda I don't know if you looked at it closely but there's a lot of really great um, individual and, and corporate donations to our schools and and just on that final note um, some of our local businesses like Firmington Lanes and Wang's Kitchen um, and uh, the Heating Dude are, um, are helping to step up to, to help the class of 2021 uh, make their senior year celebration something special. So again, I just, I just want to shout out that it's easy to focus on some of the, the kind of negative things around um, the world right now, but it's, uh, it's, it's super great to see that spirit of generosity and, and, and giving, um, especially right here in Firmington. So um, thanks. That's it. Also, spring's right around the corner, so I've got my short sleeve shirts on. Hopefully, maybe you've all dumped your sweaters as well. Um, and hopefully, we'll see each other live soon. Carrera. Yeah. You know, Kylie brought up a good point. Uh, uh, kudos goes out to everybody that touches our students out there, from our local businesses to our families to our PTPs to, I mean, it's it, it takes everybody, you know, group effort on that. And, you know, it's funny to look back. I remember when the high school first got built, and I remember the, the designs for those uh, tennis courts. So it's kind of nice to see uh, them going into play. And now we're going to miss the big fire pit out there. So I'm assuming that's going to be moving now. But, uh, Dan, great job on all that, uh, the facility stuff. It's amazing, you know, with the economy and everything that everybody's hit with now, we're still moving forward and getting so much accomplished. And it, kudos goes out to everybody on that. So. Again, thank you everybody on that. That's all I have. All right, I just have a couple of quick things. I'm, I, what I just wanna mention is it's just nice to see that things are starting to 
pick up with activity with the science fairs and different choirs and ensembles that are going on that it's starting to feel more normal, shall we say, than what it's been, even though we still have various restrictions going on. And I just, you know, thanks to those involved as well as all have said before, I'm just asking everyone to have a little patience as everyone gets back into that full term school because it has been, as we've said for many of us, it has been a year and not only just for the education piece, but having to be, you know, on full time in a classroom with everyone and kind of even those introverts and extroverts, that's going to be a little bit of a challenge going back to that full time piece. So just exercise some patience and give yourself some grace and some time to adjust as we go forward. But I know we will do a great job and I'm grateful for everything the district is doing to plan for that. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I move to I'll make a motion to adjourn at 8.15. Second. All right, motion by Doyle, second by Carrero. Roll call vote. Member Simmons? Yes. Member Christensen? Yes. Member Carraro? Yes. Member Doyle? Yes. Member Coletta? Yes. Chair Saucer? Yes, motion passes. We are adjourned. And quick note, our next meeting is a month, almost a month from today. It's in April. So we've got a, a week off. <laughs>